in this presentation, I'm going to tell you why and how ice on land and the resulting ice extent is important for the temperature regulation of Earth. There's, when you talk to people that have studied climate, there's a lot of things that some people think drive the climate. Uh, the alarmists think that uh, greenhouse gas CO2 is one of the biggest influences. Uh, some people think that Milankovitch cycles or uh, cosmic rays, all kinds of things, but every one of them, or most of them, say that these things start something going and then they get uh, feedback from ice extent that helps make it work. Well, I say take the ice extent and the ice on land and put it at the top of the list. Ice on land uh, regulates the ice extent and the ice extent controls temperature. Uh, this chart, I used to use about five or six different charts of temperature uh, and time. And uh, a few years ago, Sturgis Hooper posted this chart on uh, what's up with that, Anthony Webb's website. And it's got all the data, the, or most of the data that I like to talk about on one chart. So I use this chart. Uh, whoops. I can't push that button. Uh, if you look at... 500,000 years ago, uh, that time period to 100 million years ago is uh, the grossest temperature scale on here. And the temperature is on, in centigrade on the left-hand side, above and below the modern average. And the next time period is 60 million to 10 million years, and then 5 to 2 and we get on down the, the last million years and then the last 20,000 years. This is the modern time that we live in, right there on the right-hand side of this chart. I don't talk about this date over here, so I cut it off, and I made a chart that didn't have that on it. Uh, ice extent 50 million years ago was very low, and the temperature of Earth was, 20, was 14 degrees higher than the modern normal. Uh, temperature got colder throughout the years until 20,000 years ago, ice extent was the maximum we've seen on this chart, and it was six degrees colder than now. And then we warmed out of the last major ice age into this modern normal 10,000 year period. Uh, our radiation in the tropics does most of the cooling of the earth but it doesn't have a fixed thermostat if something warms up the earth it'll stabilize at a higher temperature if something cools the earth it'll stabilize at a lower temperature but our does the most cooling something regulates temperature better than that in the polar region, in the northern hemisphere, and in the southern hemisphere, there are thermostats with fixed set points. The polar oceans freeze and thaw at the same temperature. Uh, when the polar oceans thaw, uh, it increases ocean effect snowfall, and that makes Earth colder. When it, when it gets cold, the polar oceans freeze. That reduces ocean effect snowfall, and it gets warmer. Uh, I like to tell people this every time I see them. 2,000 years ago, there was a Roman warm period and it got cold. 1,000 years ago, there was a medieval warm period and it got cold. That was a little ice age. It's a natural cycle and we didn't cause it. Uh, CO2 just makes the green stuff grow better. And they got to scare us so they can tax and control us. Uh, a few years ago, Peabody Coal Company uh, went against the state of Minnesota uh, in a court case, and uh, the state of Minnesota hired some alarmist climate scientists to testify, and uh, Peabody Cole hired some skeptic scientists to testify. Basically, the alarmist scientists said that the temperature rise is going to be more than two degrees, and that's dangerous. 
And the skeptic one said, well, it's going to be a little less than two degrees, and that's not dangerous. Well, the judge decided in the favor of the, the alarmist because uh, he wanted to be on what he thinks is the safe side. You can't win court cases talking about the sensitivity of CO2. You've got to understand what the natural cycle is. If my theory is right, people need to support it, and let's use that to fight the alarmism. If my, if my theory is wrong, work together and let's find out what is right because we've got to have what causes natural climate change, and we've got to use that to fight the alarmism. Uh, water is abundant. It changes state in the temperature range that we live in. It provides thawed oceans for more snowfall and frozen oceans for less. The water in its four phases is the most important thing that regulates temperature. The earth provides us all of the energy, or most all the energy that we get. And then the water in its four phases regulates it here so that we stay in the right range. Uh, if you look at this chart, ice extent is a minimum up here. It's a maximum down here. It's changing in cycles throughout this time. Uh, if you look at the last million years, we've got ice core data for Antarctica for 800,000 years, and we've got ice core data... Whoops. We, we've got ice core data for... Uh, Greenland for about the last 120 to 50,000 years. If you look at the cycles, if you look at a temperature cycle and you look at, you can calculate ice, when they take an ice core, they measure the temperature and they measure the, the depth that that temperature was taken. You can use that to calculate an ice accumulation for the ice. And you can see that if you do that and plot it, the temperature cycles and the ice accumulation cycles fall on top of one another. When it's warmest, it's always snowing the most. When it's coldest, it's always snowing the least. Now this data trails off back here because that's old data and old ice has been, new ice has been piled on top of it and it's been pressed down and squeezed out and so the layers are thinner because they've been pressed down. When that cycle fell on the ground, it was probably as big as the one here, but it's just been compressed. Uh, if you look at, this is the modern time, this is the last major ice age, you can see that as you get here, this, this ice has been compressed some and squeezed out. If you look at the modern time, it looks like ice accumulation is a lot more that ice has recently fell and it's still got air in it. It hasn't been compacted yet. This ice has been compacted, but it hasn't been squeezed and flows out yet. If you look at an ice cycle, the warmest time is when it's snowing the most and volume of ice is increasing. The coldest time is when it's snowing the least and the ice volume is decreasing. The ice is always melting and flowing. When it snows more than it melts, it accumulates, and when it snows less than it melts, it depletes. When the ice extent is increasing, we get cooling. When the ice extent is decreasing, we get warming. The minimum ice extent on Earth is the warmest time. And ice extent includes ice on land and includes sea ice shelves and it could, uh, includes sea ice. So when ice extent is the least, we're at the warmest time. When ice extent is the most, we're at the coldest time. The minimum ice volume occurs during this warming time. Ice is depleting, but the snowfall is increasing. At some point, snowfall matches the melt, and then from there on, ice volume is increasing. The maximum ice volume is somewhere down on this cold, uh, decreasing temperature side. Ice volume is increasing, 
but snowfall is decreasing. At some point, they match, and then down here, it depletes. The minimum ice extent is here. The maximum ice extent is here. Uh, ice is always melting. I pick a temperature on this increasing temperature line and decreasing temperature line that's the same temperature. Those two points have the same temperature, so the ice extent on Earth is at about the same amount. The melting of ice here and the melting of ice here, or the, the ice extent is about equal. The reason that this line is warming is because it snowed less down here, ice is depleted, and it can't push the ice. The reason that this side is cooling is because it snowed more up here and the ice volume got huge and ice extent is increasing because there's more ice volume pushing it. <clears throat> so ice extent is the cause of all of these temperature changes, or most of it. And all of these, we've got ice core data that shows the ice cycles here. But these other cycles are all ice cycles. Every peak is a time of more snowfall when ice volume is increasing. Every valley is a time of less snowfall and ice is depleting. Every cycle took ice out of the oceans and put some on temperate land where it melted and went back in the ocean. Every cycle took ice out of the ocean and put it on Antarctica and Greenland and the high mountains where it did not return to the ocean. It's getting colder because the ice volume on Earth is gradually increasing. And these cycles, in this last billion years, they got bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, some people say that's caused by Milankovitch. Uh, I agree that Milankovitch had an effect, but it's not like we, people think. The Milankovitch warming caused more snowfall, which then caused ice extent to grow. As the Milankovitch cycle got colder, the ice extent was growing. They resonated together to make these huge cycles. But when we came out of this last major ice age 20,000 years ago, we warmed up to this new modern paradise. The last 10,000 years have been bounded in the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere in the same bounds in a flat, uh, with a flat peak. If you look at these other peaks, none of those were flat like this. This is different. Every cycle took ice out of the ocean and didn't put it all back, and now there's not enough water in the ocean to, cause a, to allow a, more, a major warm period or a major ice age. And so this presentation told you how and why ice on land and the resulting ice extent is important for the temperature regulation of Earth. Uh, this is a repeat of what I already told you. These charts for the rest of this are not part of my regular presentation. They tell you things. If you read it without me, it tells you some things that uh, I told you. But one, I'll try to get to one of them here that I like to show. Uh, over the last 10,000 years, the Milankovitch cycle has taken energy whoops, out of the northern hemisphere and added energy to the southern hemisphere. And we're talking a lot of watts per meter squared above 60 degrees and below 60 degrees. And in that time, this ice cycle regulated the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere in the same bounds. This dark blue is Antarctic ice core, and this light blue is uh, Arctic ice core, the Greenland ice core. You can see as we came out of the last ice age, we have these glitches. That's because at the last ma uh, glacial maximum, all that ice wasn't still frozen. Much of it had already thawed. But the ice in the northern hemisphere has to flow north. A lot of it has to flow north to get back in the ocean, and it was blocked. So even though a lot of the ice had melted uh, 20,000 years ago, it didn't get back in the ocean yet. So this warming period 
is while the water is getting back in the ocean and the ice extent is finally decreasing. And this modern paradise is because the ice is just right for this modern cycle. Are there any questions? Uh -huh. um, you, you put um, at the top of the so, list of things that affect the Earth's temperature as, as being the ice extent on land. Um, there's a, a British researcher called Piers Corbin who puts solar flares at the top of his list. Um, could you just comment a little bit on what you agree or disagree with his thesis compared with yours? Now, can you repeat some of that? I didn't catch all of that. Uh, you, you said that the top of the list of the reason for the earth warming or cooling was the extent of ice on land. There's a British researcher called Piers Corbin, who's, for information, is the brother of the uh, leader of the opposition in Britain, uh, who's a weather scientist. And his view is that the top of the list for... Uh, the coolness or the warmth of Earth is all due to solar flares and solar activity. And I was just wondering how much you agreed or disagreed with his thesis. Well, I went to the London uh, Climate Conference a month ago, and we argued about that then, and I can't answer it now. <laughs> I, I'm right and he's wrong, I think, and I'm wrong and he's right, he thinks. And uh, what we need to do is we need to get together and have workshops and figure out who's right. Because I may be right, and if I'm wrong, we need to find out what is right. And if he's right, we need to find it out. We need to find out what is right and work toward promoting that to defeat the alarmism. Okay. Any other question? Yeah. How, how, is it, uh, how do you know how much ice there was a million years ago? Uh, I mean, I don't mean you, but I mean, how was it determined? The, for 800,000 years, we have the ice core data from Antarctica, and we have the ice core data for about 120 to 50,000 years from Greenland. And I can look at the cycles in that time where we have the records, and I just see the same pattern going back backwards, so I project the same type of cycle going backwards. I can't prove it, but uh, it, it looks just like it. No, I meant, what, what's the theory underlying it? How do they determine uh, uh, the thickness of the ice from so many years ago? Well, for the last 800,000 years, they measured it with ice cores. But we know that as the ice piles up, it squeezes out. So the actual records of the uh, ice accumulation that we have from uh, a million years ago is a lot less. But we know that that's just a lot less because it got squeezed out. And uh, we can't know exactly how much. But we know that it was probably the same orders of magnitude as the more recent snowfalls. Uh, up until the last 20,000 years when we haven't had the same magnitude of snowfall that we had in the, in the previous million years. We had more snowfall 150,000 years ago because the oceans were higher and warmer. There was more water available to put ice on land. It's not there anymore. Okay. Um, Pierre? Uh, thanks. I think the stuff that you presented is good looking, but I don't think we can reduce it to a single factor. I mean, just looking on ice is one thing, but the multifactoriality about other issues like aerosols, carbon dioxide, and all the other stuff that comes into it, especially if you look at the ICPP con comments on aerosol insecurity, <clears throat> this is one of the major contributions and fluctuations of climate change. So I would not dare to really reduce it to ice alone. If, if you look at the uh, ice extent and temperature 50 million years ago, and you look at the ice extent and temperature 20,000 years ago, there's nothing in all of those other factors that was that big. The only thing that was that big was the ice extent. Now, I, I agree that a lot of these other factors do have an influence, and they do resonate with the ice cycles, but the ice cycles 
have to be the biggest influence in my mind. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you were wondering about both sides being right, and you're not sure. I'm wondering if the uh, you are both right. Sorry, because the pollution isn't acclimating. So we have the temperature difference, and it isn't because of the CO2, as you're proposing, but is there is just so much pollution, and it is not acclimating into the system. So whether it's cooler or warmer, that well, is part of why they're saying that it's well, if you're talking the about, CO2. If you're talking about CO2 pollution, we have a lot more CO2 now than we had in the Roman warm period and the medieval warm period, and both those periods got warmer than now. So if the more CO2 is causing us to be warmer, We'll have to get warmer than they got, and we're and we're not even headed that way. Um, uh, I thought, um, what what are your thoughts about the ongoing geoengineering program? Is it a threat uh, for your for your theory or your documentation? Uh, geoengineering, uh, if it's effective. And it's done without understanding, it could be dangerous. Uh, people talk about trying to control the temperature of the earth. For the northern hemisphere, the water from the Gulf Stream ro flows into the Arctic through a very narrow channel and circles around and comes back out. You could build a dam there and have a huge influence on the temperature of the earth. But you're not going to do it with uh, greenhouse gases because the Ice, the thermostat's going to turn the snowfall on and it's going to limit that upper bound of temperature. You've got to mess with the, ice, with the water currents to make a major change. Okay, any other question? Okay. On, the, on that last question, um, one of the theories on geoengineering is that all the aluminium and barium that's now in the sky is causing some temperature moderation or temperature increase on the earth because it's actually acting as a, instead of a reflective layer, it's acting as an insulation layer and that's mm. causing the, the earth to heat up. W which is more compensatory? Is it the sort of the, the man-made influences uh, such as that from seen from chemtrails that's causing the insulatory effect or is it more in your view, the more the, the ice side of things or indeed solar flares that's, that's causing In it. my mind, uh, in between the upper bounds and the lower bounds, almost anything you do can push temperature around. But when it tries to put it out of bounds, it's like the air conditioner in your house. You bring in 20 extra people, and if your air conditioner is big enough, as it gets warmer, the, the thermostat turns the air conditioner on and it runs it till it's cold again. If you push temperature around in Earth... If you push it above that temperature that the polar oceans thaw, it starts snowing and it snows till it gets cold again. So that upper bound is set. Uh, other things influence temperature clearly. You can see too many correlations to say they don't. Okay. Um, thank you very much for your presentation.